good evening. Good evening, members, and to all our guests that are here tonight. Very pleased that you could attend. Um, we, we're going to do this slightly different tonight in the way of we've got our speakers, but we're also doing it sort of a lot more cross um, talking and questioning. Um, so we're, we're trying this out. But thank you all for coming. Um, we go into apologies for absence, number one. We've Please. had apologies from Councillor Dan Adam, Paul Deach and Valerie White. Thank you. Sorry. I'll... Sorry, we've had apologies from Dan Adams, Paul Deach and Valerie White. Done the chairman's announcement. So I'll go on to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting held on the 6th of September 2022. Are you in agreement and noted, members? Thank you. Item four declarations of interest. Anybody to declare? Yes. Councillor Noble. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wish to declare a non pecuniary interest as a founding trustee of the Bisley and West End Food Bank. Thank you. So we go into item five and we go straight into our first presentation. This is from Kate, who's from the Citizens Advice Bureau, and I think you're probably very busy with all of this, Kate. Thank you for coming. And if you could, your presentation, um, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yes, yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the impact of the cost of living crisis and also what support has been made available in Surrey Heath. Next slide, please. Surrey County Council carried out a survey on the cost of living um, back in August. They had approximately 800 respondents and they, the data is weighted to be represented for the county based on age and gender. And for Surrey, that means that nearly a fifth of respondents had a household income of above 100,000 and responded. There is a clear evidence that people are starting to feel the effect of the cost of living. Around 74% have reduced their spending on eating out and takeaways. 63% have reduced spending on trips out. And in the last three months, 74% have made changes in their behaviour because they're worried about affording to run appliances. So that things like um, not putting on the tumble dryer and, and using the dishwasher less, etc. More Of more concern is that in the last three months, 20% have skipped meals and or reduced portion sizes. And approximately 8% have gone without food or energy for a whole day because they couldn't afford it. Of those who have an, a prepaid energy meter, 56%, that's over half, have run out of energy before being able to afford more. And bearing in mind that this survey was carried out in August, um, they're intending it to run it again in, the, in um, the winter, but it's quite concerning the effect that it's already having on people. Next slide, please. So Citizens Advice have been tracking the effect of the rising cost of living across the country. And since September 2021, low-income households have seen their monthly costs increase by £141. We've seen more people in need of crisis support this year than ever before. And by April next year, low-income households will have seen their monthly costs rise by over £200 compared to September 2021. And that's assuming the energy price guarantee remit costs that aren't matched by benefit increases will compound this and leave people in an impossible situation. Next slide, please. An example of this is Alma. She's recovering from cancer and can't work, and she recently started receiving universal credit, but she won't receive any additional money due to her ill health until after three months. This leaves her only £3 per month after she's paid for food, rent and other necessary bills. And as the cost of living increases, she has no way to increase her income and is finding it difficult to eat and heat her home. So the inflation continues to rise, she's put in a very impossible situation. 
And we're seeing more and more clients like Alma and some who don't even have anything left over after they've paid for essential bills. Next slide, please. So locally in Citizens Advice, we've seen a 44% increase in demand for food bank referrals on the same period last year, 31% increase in benefit inquiries, 45% in debt issues, and a 94% increase in utility issues. The main debt issue in Surrey Heath was council tax arrears, um, but we're now seeing utility issues overtaking that. That's not to say that still a lot of people are struggling with their council tax. We've also seen a huge demand in increase in demand for energy, um, sorry, emergency financial support. This is partly due to us administering the Household Support Fund. But the total claims in Household Support Fund in uh, the first and second round, so since November 2021, were 3,745. And in the latest round that only opened two weeks ago, we've already had 395 applications. We've distributed 297,000, over 297,000. And that's gone across all the wards. But the important thing to see is that um, those wards with the highest rates of deprivation are receiving the most funds, with Old Dean, the Old Dean receiving almost 20% of those funds and St Michael's around 13%. As well as those who are more vulnerable and the clients that we've seen um, regularly over the years, we're seeing a different type of client and more people needing food bank referrals who've never accessed this sort of support before. Many people who are in work but still struggling. There's increased anxiety and fear about managing through the winter and people coming to us who feel they've exhausted every option to cut back on their spending and increase their income, and yet it's still not enough. One thing of particular concern at the moment is those that are on smart meters and have energy debts. Some of these energy companies are switching them to prepayment meters without their consent or, or uh, agreement. And what that means is when they top up their energy, say they top their energy up by 30 pounds, maybe only 10 pounds of that goes for, for the energy, and the um, energy company takes the other 20 pounds towards their debt. So Citizens Advice are trying to um, ask for a moratorium on switching people to prepayment meters because that is putting people in a very vulnerable position over the winter. Next slide, please. So what has government done to help? Well, government has put in quite a substantial package of support. So before the autumn statement, um, there was the cost of living payments, which were £650 um, towards those on households on means-tested benefits. There were disability cost of living payments of £150 and pensioner payment cost of living payments of um, £300. Next slide, please. In addition, there was a council tax rebate of £150 for those living in council tax bands A to D in England. The household support fund that I've mentioned before. The energy price guarantee, which was introduced to reduce the unit cost of electricity and gas for UK households. And every household received £400 um, off their energy bills, which is being paid in six monthly instalments. Next slide, please. Citizens Advice has been campaigning government um, for further changes, and we were very pleased to see that many of the things we asked for um, came about in the autumn statement. One of the key things was an uplift in universal credit in line with inflation. There are over 5,100 um, residents in Surrey Heath who were claiming universal credit in September, so this makes a big difference to them their benefit rate will increase by 10.1% in April, and pensioners will also uh, get an increase of 10.1%. We also ask for additional crisis support to help people through the winter because of the rising inflation and the extreme um, costs of living, particularly around energy. And again, the government has added a further package of support, 
including a further £900 cost of living payment to those on means tested benefits, again 150 to those with a disability and £300 to pensioners, as well as extending the household support fund to um, April and, and for the, a further year to come. They have also um, agreed an extension to the energy price guarantee after April 2023, but there will be an increase um, in the average payment from 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. So that's still gonna mean that people's costs are gonna go up. Hopefully at that time, the weather will improve and their energy costs will go down because the important thing around the price guarantee, it, it, that 2,500 is an average. It's based on the unit cost. If people use more energy, they will be paying more. So it's just important to understand that. Next slide, please. There is a package of support that we have available locally. So as, as I've talked about, the Household Support Fund, which has been a really vital source of um, support to people, and, and we are getting out to as many residents as possible. In addition, Surrey County Council have the Surrey Crisis Fund, which again is there for emergency support. And we have our own small charitable pots, including the Hardship Fund, which was funding from yourselves, Project Wenceslas, which is from Woking Lions, <coughs> from the fuel allotments have made grants, and we also have fuel bank foundation vouchers. We're able to provide people with energy advice appointments, and for those that are really struggling, those extra funding pots mean that there is some money that can help people when they're really, when they're really in crisis. We anticipate that there will be a, a very large demand in January and February when a lot of the count, uh, government payments will have been made and people are left at the coldest time of the year with their bills still high. In addition, we're very fortunate to have uh, Beeson Food Bank, um, Woking and Bisley, other food bank um, around and we can refer to them as, as other organisations can. The Free Food Stall and Breakfast Club and Old Dean providing increasing numbers of meals and support for people. We are doing more outreach advice um, and we are intending to go to the warm hubs that are being set up across the borough to provide energy advice and debt advice um, and people can go to these warm hubs for a safe space and get a hot drink and keep out of the cold. And obviously there are, there are other schemes um, being developed such as community larders and other charitable support. That's um, a quick sum up of what's happening locally and, and the impact that we're seeing. Are there any questions? I'll open it up to the floor, Josephine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. We have worked together absolutely uh, reasonably well. Um, a, a couple of things, uh, if I may. The first page, I couldn't read any of it because the figures were that small, the survey you did. and I'm. I'm trying to peer at it at the same time, and I couldn't read where you have the, the cost of that one. I couldn't read any of it, and I even looked behind here. I wonder if we might have a, a larger slide. That would be very helpful. Thank you. It, just so that next time round, when you say we, um, the survey will be repeated, so that I can, um, because I tend to have paper copies, I find it a lot easier. Um, uh, I, uh, and also, uh, I appreciate it when you say, you know, a percentage. Um, percentages, um, you know, can mean anything. I, I was grateful when you said the, what the actual figures were. I do find that because you, you can't always sort of relate to uh, percentages. Um, do you uh, work at all with the debt uh, or send people to the debt advisory service? Or is, I'm not sure if that's still in existence. We, we have our own debt case. Could you put the microphone up so that it's, cause it's recorded? Um, yes, we have our own debt case workers, that, so we will work um, with people who are in debt and in, in more intensely. We can refer people to debt services and obviously frontline as well. So I know that there used, uh, sorry for inter that there used to be a debt advisory service. I wasn't sure if that's still in existence, is that? Or? No, okay. It's the money advice service. There's various sort of online... Yeah, I think it was someone the council used to work with the debt advisory service. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing, Frimley Fuel Allotments. I used to be uh, a member of the fuel allotments. So are you steering people towards them to ask for money or are they giving it? Because I know it's, uh, it is very specific 
or it used to be very specific on what they actually gave grants for. So it's the combination. So we will refer people to them for their winter fuel grants yeah, that yeah. they provide and other support, but they've also given a grant to us of £5,000, not for us to spend, but for us to use, to put towards helping clients to go with the hardship mm. funds um, and the other small pots that we have. So in addition to the household support fund, if people then come back and they're still struggling, we can work mm. with them and we have that option to, in you know, if if it's deemed suitable, yeah, can, we can give them that extra bit of funding. I know that the, the I think it was, um, um, it may well have changed now, their criteria used to be people in need and distress. We could say that's an awful lot of people at the moment. But for specific needs, uh, you know, somebody is in distress and it's always worth going to, I think, to, to see... Um, you know, if they can help, obviously it has to be specific things. Yeah. What we, what we try and do, what they try and do is, in, if, if somebody goes to them for help, they say to them, "Well, you need to mm. go and see us about, you know, why you've got these debts and yeah. what we can." And that's what we try to do is to work with those people to try and find the underlying cause and see what can be done to try and help them longer term rather than just. Yeah. giving them a payment. And, and I know the winter away. fuel thing was very good, because I used to be part of that. And I'm pleased to say that, uh, I'm not plugging Surrey County Council, but a lot of the stuff that you have mentioned is that actually, I think every resident has received that. So it's also a helpful reminder to people. There is help there, but it's a case of knowing how to get it. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure whether I have a non-pecuniary interest in this about what I'm going to say, so I declare that I have. Um, there's two charities in Chobham, which I know help with, and, and they have uh, helped with the food bank at Bisley. And as far as I'm aware, we've had no actual referrals this year from people in the Chobham and West End area, which we could help with certain heating, you know, certain things. As um, just been stated, there is a, a remit that you have to work to, but the money's there. And we have had, and Chobham certainly isn't rich, or some of it is, um, we certainly have had, we've had no increase in requests this year at all. And we've been waiting sort of for the last 18 months expecting somebody to come and ask. And. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. I just wondered, and I know that we've been trying to, to work with the uh, West End and Bisley Food Bank, but GDPR makes a real problem because, you, as you were well aware, you're not allowed to give people's names and you only can get new if you go to the schools unless the people actually come to you. you there's nothing you can do. And I just wondered if you know, you'd, you'd forgotten about us and whether you wanted to use us. I, I'm sure we have. I, I... Personally, I'm aware of somebody that we've referred. I, th I think what happens is because um, of the the area that we cover, is Chobham and West End, etc., is that if it's not an area that Beeson cover, we tend to refer to the Woking food banks that people can go and collect um, food support. But if they're unable to go and collect, or if they do live in West End and Bisley, we will refer them, um, or, you know, to, to to the West End and, and Bisley food bank for support. Um, but Initially, they would often people in Chobham in that area would be referred to the Woking Food Bank that cover those areas as well. Yes, just saying, Pat, we could we could promote that if you so wish. I think you know that we find we aren't getting the referrals, and I mean we. We put our pieces out of paper in all the local fish and chip shop and the, you know, all the local halls saying that if people are in need to make an application. And we, we find that very rarely forthcoming. I mean, we do have a criteria, and like everything else, you, you, you know, people apply and think they're, and you, you know. But yes, we do have it in Chobham and it would be good because if they could get in that loop, as you say, get in that loop is a, a, something that happens every year and um, a lot of people could benefit. Right. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I concur with the increase in food bank referrals. Certainly at Bisley and West End, we are seeing a significant increase. We're now supporting more people than we have ever supported. Just wanted to ask, what you, you mentioned that you anticipate demand increasing in January. Do you have any um, sort of idea of figures for, for that? opened um, if that can if it carries on at that rate the money will could well be exhausted by we get by the time we get to January um, the government uh, payments will have been made um, so it unless things improve for people and there's not much sign of that we can see these people still coming to for us to support but we won't necessarily have that money to to support them with and there is there's a little bit of a risk about people becoming dependent and, and which is why that we're trying to introduce this sort of criteria of working that people if people want that financial support they've also got to work with us to try and look at the problem rather than just please give me some money and then they disappear um, I'm interested in seeing and hearing what you, you've said. I, I've noted this afternoon there are at least seven warm hubs throughout the borough, which I think is fantastic. It, it's churches and libraries and everything else. Um, and you're obviously telling the um, clients that come to you about them. I just feel, um, as a council, we, it's all about communication, isn't it? And so what I would ask as a request that our communications team um, put this up on the council Facebook page and you can copy it across the face. There's a lot of Facebook groups within the borough and I think that will be an, a really important way of communicating as well as yourself. Um, I, I would ask actually whether the individual councillors could um, message, particularly about the household support fund because we saw quite a big <laughs> surge in applications when the individual councillors posted and shared that on social media. Um, so if they could be encouraged to do that, that would be really helpful. That be noted there. Yes. Okay. So what we're looking at really now is, is there any other things you'd like us as a council to help with? Um, with the CAB, Kate? I, th I think it is that communication, communications definitely um, getting the message out there um, as much as, as possible. And that seems to be happening. There seems to be quite a plan. I believe that it's gone out in Heath scene. Um, and obviously there's the Surrey directory has gone out as well. But the, uh, the sharing information, as I say, by, the, by count local councillors would be really useful. Yes, I think. Rodney. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had one question. There was a comment earlier that was made about council tax and um, that the, the, there was council tax arrears was, was something that the CAB were beginning to notice a bit more. Now, one of the, one of the questions for us as a council is obviously we, it's important for us to get the council tax in, but um, we do have a hardship fund which is available. So I guess my question is, um, are CAB clients accessing that hardship fund? Are there any things that we need to be aware of about that hardship fund? Is it set at the right level? Um, because that's, that's something which the council is going to be discussing next week. So I guess it's questions around our hardship fund and how accessible it is. Um, I would say that it is not being used excessively at the moment because our priority is the household support fund. What we want is that government money to be spent as a priority. And that hardship fund will be the backup for when the household support fund uh, finishes. So that combined with the other pots of funding, um, I think there's around about just over £7,000 left in the hardship fund. So there is money in there still. Um, but I think that that will get used up 
very quickly next year when, once the government support finishes. gone off <laughs> modern technology um, we've got them here um, I don't know Chris would you like to say anything about the food bank and what you're doing thank you <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know I'm, I'm Chris uh, the vicar at Martin's um, on the old Dean and enjoying rich partnerships with the old Dean community group with Surrey Heath Borough Council with Surrey County Council just doing everything we can really to fight food poverty and fuel poverty. And from my own personal perspective on the ground, helping all the time in, in the community, the need is absolutely huge. Before the pandemic and the old Dean, it was near crisis. It was a crisis when the pandemic hit. And now it's just silly. So to give some anecdotal evidence, uh, St Martin's run the free food store with the Aldean Community Group. It's a pleasure to partner with Treffer. It really is. And Sunday afternoon, uh, the queue and the free food store just went on and on and on, servicing around 60 families um, every Sunday. And those, and those people change every Sunday. So actually we're servicing around 200 families. And as I say, those people are changing. So the free food store, it's a, it's a great need. Uh, we felt at first that it wouldn't be sustainable, but actually it is very, very sustainable. Um, we, we're in, in the course of looking to set up a community larder as well, together with the Old Dean Community Group. We felt that would um, take over the free food store, but actually there's such a huge need for the free food store. It's such an established resource that we very much want to keep it going. So we're looking at, to set up a community larder midweek as well, but we want to do that in a sustainable, missional way, so we look forward to that as well. So that's the free food store, but the free food store is, 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 is great and it's fantastic. We felt uh, we need to do more because the free food store combats food poverty. But it doesn't just do that. You know, it provides a space to have those pastoral conversations, to have those supportive conversations. So in addition to that, we set up the free community breakfast, which Kate referred to as the Breakfast Club. And that's a place where you can have those conversations. At the free food store, you can start those conversations, and they really embellish themselves at the free community breakfast, which is simply a place where you can get a good meal for free every week, which is very much needed. So it was bacon rolls a couple of weeks ago. It was pastries um, last week. It's pancakes this coming week, and the cereals and toast and coffee. Again, there's such a great need, ladies and gentlemen. So week one, we set up not last September, but September before that. Week one, we had 30 people, and now we're averaging 65 people every week. That's an average. Sometimes it's much higher. You know, sometimes it's topping 70, 80. It's such a great need. People come there, and they pour their hearts out. So we have the conversations about their household support fund and all that sort of stuff. We build on the need to combat social isolation by providing Wednesday Cafe and Saturday Cafe. They are free places we can come and have a drink and have something to eat. So tomorrow morning we've got Wednesday Cafe. It doubles as a warm hub. Yes. You're really warm. You can get a hot drink. Yeah. There's homemade cakes. <laughs> And again, the numbers are just rocketed. So pre-pandemic, pre, uh, we had 10, 12 people. After pandemic, we're averaging 30. Last week, we had 60. We'll see what happens there, because it suddenly rock almost doubled. It went to about 40, 50, but now 60. Tim, you, you come to the uh, cafe, don't you? So you, you, know, you know, it used to be a bit quiet in the old days, but it's certainly doubled now. Yeah, um, so it's a great place to, to have those conversations. And we repeat it at Saturday Cafe, where there's, there's toast and, and, uh, and that sort of stuff. But from the ground, I can't say enough, the need is catastrophic. I would say it's beyond crisis at Neil Dean. People pour their hearts out in grief. You know, just today, I 
um, sorted out some food for someone who didn't have any food. It's, it's ongoing. So I think all that we can do to support people in crisis is hugely valued and much appreciated because you know, seeing people on, in tears on almost a daily basis because they can't cope with life, I think, you know, just all we can do for them to help is great. Warm hubs are great um, because we get those hot drinks. Um, we provide <coughs> blankets as well. We run a blanket box so people donate blankets and we give blankets away. The food's there. And we're working with Surrey County Council to provide people who can give energy advice. They're currently being trained, so we look forward to receiving them. And also to give us a, um, a live energy efficient tool. I look forward to that as well. But please do come and see. Come to Wednesday Cafe. Come to Saturday Cafe. Come to the free food store. Come to the free community breakfast. Come see it in action, please. And come and have those conversations. But partnership is key. St. Martin's really a thing without partnerships. A partnership with Aldean Community Group. Partnership with Surrey Heath Borough Council. Partnership with Surrey County Council. Partnership with Beeson. Partnership with KWF Chancellor. Don't be okay. I'll, I'll be quiet. You can see how passionate about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, Terry uh, Emmons uh, gives us um, food at cost for the free food store yeah. downtown. You know, Terry Emmons, you see him outside the square at cost. He's a good man. Yeah. Um, Josephine, did I? Uh, thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you. I, I was aware of some of it, uh, but not all of it. I wasn't aware about the cafes and what have you. Um, and uh, sort of going on from the chairman, to, where do you get? Uh, your support from, I mean, apart from, uh, I know of Mr. Emmett, 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 Emmett's Emporium, isn't it? Um, do the local supermarkets uh, donate, or, or is it people who, you know, uh, who, do people come along and, and sort of donate, sort of stay and have breakfast, but also bring things to dinner? I just wonder where, you know, how you're, you're managing to cope with so many people are coming. It sounds absolutely amazing. Thank you. Yeah, um, every, every um, thing we do is, is different in terms of donations. So with the free food store, yes, we get the food at, at cost. But also, um, people give non-perishable goods from the community. So, yes, the old deal, of course, is an area of multiple deprivation, but it's also a mixed economy. So there are more, how can I put it, more middle-class elements there, I, I would suggest, you can afford to give. So there is non-perishable goods given. We also have a strong partnership with the co-op um, and they provide um, areas in the Old Dean co-op and the Frimley Road co-op where they can drop goods off. Um, so items are given um, by the community um, in addition to Terry Evans. Um, I mean, I get bags and bags and bags of food left at, at my doorstep at the, at the vicarage. Um, I've also got a strong partnership with the schools. So I go into the schools, and I'm a governor of the three schools in the Old Dean, and they provide uh, food when they can, including this week. Um, so that's the free food store. Um, with the cafe, a member came to the um, cafe, uh, just really loved what she saw, readily makes his homemade cakes. People come in and again give us cakes because, again, they're, they're touched. That's, that's the Wednesday Cafe. Um, Saturday Cafe, um, we have toast there. I mean, you know, we provide that. For the breakfast, um, again, people are seeing uh, the community give and just want to give. So, for example, two chaps turned up about four weeks ago. They said, oh, I don't like this. I like what's going on here. And I mentioned pastries as one of the specials, didn't I? Well, they now buy all the pastries for us because they've got a successful business, mentioning businesses. So they now give um, the pastries for us. And people just chip in. 
So Councillor Mark Gordon, for example, you may know, runs um, the uh, King's Arms and Bag Shop. Yeah. Well, you'll see him when, uh, at the free community breakfast serving bacon for us. <laughs> he serves bacon for us. And um, so people contribute um, when they can to the free community breakfast. Um, but, but I think really my main thing I want to say is I have to apply for grants left, right and centre. So if there's a grant going, I'll apply for it. Um, for example, we mentioned um, Family Fuel Allotments. They gave us a generous grant for the free community breakfast. Um, you mentioned the supermarkets. Um, we're looking to tap into the supermarket provision uh, through the community larder. That's where, that's where we, we want to kind of subsidise it there. So we're, we're holding on to that because of the community larder idea. But yeah, grants left, right and centre. But because there is such a need, the grants are always there. There's always new grants. And, and, the, and the free, the, um, free food stores are a prime example of that. Myself and Sheffield really thought we'd run out of money. But we really haven't. And the next one we're going to go for is um, the uh, Community Fund for Surrey. Um, so Dennis, this is uh, the um, free food store. Uh, he looks after it, I understand. And uh, he, he encouraged us to apply for it uh, two weeks ago. I think it was two or three weeks ago. So I hope that answers your question, Josephine. Oh, it sounds absolutely amazing. I'll be along for pastries. Um. Please come, <laughs> come and see. Come Thank and you. see, please. So now, so sometimes the numbers will be much higher, sometimes a bit lower. Sean, I see your yes. hand up. Wonderful point, Sean. Sean, 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 Sean is on, Sean the, is on the free food store in every Sunday. He's brilliant. Thank, so thank you. And I suppose I should, I should state an interest then, shouldn't I? Um, as a trustee of um, the Old Dean Community Group. Yeah. I just wanted to um, just pick up on some of the stuff that Chris has said. Um, it's fair to say that this week was one of the busiest... I, I, I'm not there every Sunday these days, um, but this week was one of the busiest weeks I've seen in a long time. Um, and this being the week that a lot of people get paid as well. So it's certainly... And as Chris also says, it's not the same people every, um, every week. But what I want to pick up on is the fact that there are people now helping on the stall that at the yeah. very beginning of the stall starting were being supported by the stall, yeah. but now don't necessarily struggle as much and are now helping run the stall and are donating things to the stall. So it's, it's metamorphosis yeah. um, into a very... Uh, the community spirit in the last X amount of uh, years has certainly grown. It was always big. Um, but it's certainly grown a lot in the last few years. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's certainly on the increase. And we actually had a conversation, which was a really weird conversation, Sunday after we'd finished. We, we'd had a whole pile of donations. And I actually said to Chris, Where, do, we, do we need to stop asking for donations? Because we're running out of space to put it. Right. And to which Chris says, no, I've got loads of room in my garage. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're at the stage at the moment where we've got lots of donations. But also, at the same time, we maybe find ourselves in three weeks' time where we suddenly have got nothing. So the, the ge generosity of spirit is not just from the old Dean. It's, Ooh. I know from bag shop during, also during um, harvest festivals, a lot of the lo other local churches were donating uh, food as well. So yeah, I mean, the community spirit is not just supporting the old Dean, um, but there is a lot of community spirit out there across, across the borough. So I know Chris and Trevor is a brilliant idea and they're doing a really, really good job. And I just want to echo everything Chris has said. Cool. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, sorry, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for being late. I wonder is what kind of what scope is there for you to essentially cooperate with the other churches across the borough to essentially, in in almost in a, in a, in a way to franchise out what you're doing to essentially. Uh, ex kind of distill your experience and the experience of the old Dean community. I know there has been work behind the scenes in the council that has been doing it. I know I see Sarah on the other side of the chamber. I know that she does a lot. I'm just wondering, uh, how can we facilitate and how can 
we facilitate you with the other churches around the borough to kind of essentially not necessarily replicate what you do because obviously needs are different everywhere. Um, but I was wondering how can we kind of use you to activate the other churches who I know in my own ward our, our churches are, are doing a lot, but they, maybe there could be a bit more support in terms of encouraging how them to kind of think laterally and think creatively and what they could do. Well, from St Martin's Church perspective, um, at a diocesan level, I, I, I'm often having conversations with the diocese regarding what we're doing. So, for example, I spoke at a diocesan conference, the bishop asked me to speak about it. So the churches certainly know. Um, I, I think from, from you know, a council perspective, uh, myself and Trevor, Sean, be more than happy to have those conversations. And, and uh, anything you can do to facilitate that, I'd warmly welcome, because, um, as, as, as Pat said, you know, there's, there's pockets of deprivation everywhere, aren't there? There's, you know, I'm very aware that um, it's not just the old dean. It really isn't. And yes, it's a huge every need, but all that we can do uh, to reach out to all. We're very much saying that the, the, the old Dean Free Food Store is for all. So we do have people joining some of the areas. So, for example, it, it, it may be known that folks on Lakeside, refugees there, um, a good number join us. One week we had 17 folks join us. That number's now gone down. We have three people queue up from nine o'clock to join us at 12.30 from Lakeside within that past three or four weeks. A couple of lovely Spaniards. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think, you know, I'd just like to reciprocate that and say anything that I can do, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to, you know, share. Yes, if I, I can just say, as a, a member of St Paul's Church, I know that the churches together mm. um, work together to support Beesom. Um, yes. That's another good way of, of helping out, isn't it, with the, yeah. with the churches together. Yeah. yeah. And perhaps it's worth saying, uh, at St Paul's Church, uh, two Fridays ago, we met with Michael Gove, yes. and I invited Michael to come and see, and the old dean, he said yes. So I hope you have publicised as well. <laughs> Thank you. Karen, would you like to speak on... Um, I could just back up what's been said by Kate and Chris, really, uh, about the need. Um, <clears throat> I think it's interesting that in spite of having the facility you've got there, still the old dean is the by far the highest um, demanding ward in terms of um, food parcel requests. So for November... 25% of our food requests were for the old Dean. So I dread to think what it would be like if you weren't there, Chris. It would be even greater. Um, also, thanks to Kate, because a third of our referrals pretty regularly are coming from Citizens Advice. I'm sorry, Heath. Um, um, but increasingly, uh, the demand is coming from wider and wider number of different organisations. So they're popping up from all over the place. Um, <clears throat> what I was going to say, interestingly, the, the numbers of referrals went up very dramatically from September to October and November, yet October numbers this year were not significantly higher than October last year, which I thought was interesting. And I, there was a sense I was thinking that with all these financial support mechanisms that we've got, that it's just holding back the floodgates for the moment. So that was another thought um but also um what you said about and i think you both indicated that uh, the vast majority of our referrals that we're receiving now are for new cases they're not we are getting some of the very much same old same old they've been coming back to us again and again for years but there are a very significant and uh, probably over 75 percent of our cases are brand new this autumn um, and although I said the numbers of deliveries might not have varied that much in October, what I noticed significantly was the number of children increase, because we capture how many adults and how many children. Um, <clears throat> and so compared to October numbers last year, 
Uh, we added up how many children we'd fed each week, and it was 136. That might not sound a lot to you, I'm, I'm guessing, but this year it was 171. So 136, 171 is quite a, a large shift. So it's a different group of people that are finding they are needing the support. And that's significant. Mm. Um, sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, as inflation has been rising and the financial pressures are on everyone, have, has the BSM seen a reduction in um, donations made? And I, that's more of a question to everyone. I, I will be honest with you, and in this situation, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm embarrassed because the support is phenomenal. And in some respects, I'm actually going slow down because both in financial terms and food terms we had the best harvest ever I can't you know it's just it created me problems good problems to have like you said storage problems I've had to spend money to find new ways to store but yet we've got a landlord who sort of coincidentally said would you like another room you know and so we've been and that's free of charge so we've seen blessing upon blessing coming into us we are ready and geared up for when the flood happens. And not least, you mentioned asylum seekers. Now, they're not coming to us as referrals, and maybe Jane would like to say a little more about that, because A, they do not have any access to do any cooking or washing in the hotel. It's a real health and safety issue, but they can go out and eat with you. We can't provide, we, we don't prepare food, so that's where you're seeing them. But they are volunteering for us, um, five five um, South American uh, asylum seekers have come and started helping us uh, to pack food for other people. And so they do take away, because <clears throat> we can't give out any food that's past its best before date, even though I know and you know it's perfectly edible, even though, you know, it was yesterday, it was okay, today it's not to give out. Um, they can help themselves to those elements of food that are don't need cooking, uh, so there's... Yeah, all sorts of things that they, they do take away with them as well. Biscuits, for example. Yeah. And that's been a blessing. It's been fantastic. Any other questions from members? No? Can I, can I thank you all, the, the guests that we've got here tonight, Kate and Chris and Karen, for your input and valuable information, I'm sure. And the more help we can get, um, from businesses in particular, I think, and the general community giving. I mean, I, I, I've noticed your, you said, Chris, about the donations in the co-op on the old Dean. I've seen that. And Waitrose at um, Bagshot, the Bison, have, have got that and what they need. I think that's useful as well. So the more we can get this message out in whichever way and communicate across the borough, um, I think that's very good. I suppose it's worth saying that we're just about to start the... Well, we have started, sorry, not about to. We are packing Christmas hampers yes. um, alongside Rotary. And um, so on the 2nd of December, which is... Is that this Friday? Um, I should know that because it's in my diary. Um, we will actually be standing outside of Waitrose asking for specific items to go into Christmas hampers. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the lady who runs that is a lady called Jane Bocart. She normally says, don't give me any more mince pies. I have got too many. <laughs> this year, we haven't, because she's probably been saying that to too many people. Uh, we've just got tons of gravy. <laughs> tons of gravy uh, um, and no mince pies to put it on. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. I had it on and I switched it off. <laughs> um, Greg, would you like to give us an update? Yes, on what's I, can, I can provide an update in terms of the uh, Christmas hampers. So, uh, as we did last year, we're coordinating between Beesum and Rotary uh, to pull together as many hampers as possible. Uh, and uh, although they're being produced separately, we're coordinating, ensuring that we're, we're covering as many. Um, areas as possible. Um, for Rotary, we've got uh, a collection going on via uh, Collectively Camberley. I know SHBC are also doing, uh, and also the libraries across the borough are supporting us in terms of being collection points. 
so that's going well. We will be uh, starting our packing in, in a couple of weeks' time also. So, again, it's uh, um, and we share resources. If, if we, I, I gratefully received 50 uh, jars of gravy uh, today, <laughs> which will be uh, donated into the rotary boxes. So, uh, yeah, no, it's working very well. And obviously any support that we can get there is gratefully received. Thank, thank you for that. So, um, right, so as the next slide, you're very welcome to leave as guests um, whenever you, you wish, and we, then we'll return into action. Thank you all for your time this evening. It's been very valuable. Thank you. Oh, Pat, sorry, Pat. Yeah. Just before our guests go, um, I hear about the hampers, and in the villages we've got the same thing, you know, we're doing Christmas this, we're doing Christmas <coughs> that. How do you manage to ensure that everybody gets at least one rather than you go up one street and one household gets six because they get one from this one and they get one from that one and get one from the other and poor Jimmy next door doesn't get any at all and they just got the same problems. I just wondered how you got over that problem. <laughs> and try and apply you know through, through an agency to get a referral to us we will make sure no one gets two but if someone doesn't put it, someone hasn't made an opportunity to receive one then we don't know that they don't get one do you forget my drift we just need to know that they need one so they need to have a referral put in to one so of the yours food banks. yours go all by referral it's just i there was a scenario last year mm. where one family landed up with four hampers. No. Yes. And then the chap next door, he didn't get anything <sighs> at all. No. And, and it is, as you say, it's this GDPR problem. And I just wondered what sort of, how you work that system out. Because you feel, well, I feel very guilty knowing that someone got a big pile yeah. under his tree. Yeah. yeah, it used to and, happen. It did used to happen. Uh, but shouldn't do one I watch. <laughs> can't stop that yeah. team so uh, if, if they're willing to share that information we can obviously smaller it's very very difficult you to, say to willing do. but it seems to be that they believe they can't it's not that they don't want to that they believe they can't so they, they can't unless they have expressed permission from the individuals to You're share their data that's and of course many individuals are reluctant to do that yes um, uh, and so that's the challenge we've got we can only do the best we can it wasn't meant as a criticism no, no, of any no, sort I agree. Yeah. It, it's just a real challenge I was hoping for a bit of assistance <laughs> Thank you. Well, I say we have done it across the 250 that between Rotary and Visa mm. we share. So that's a start, and if we can mm. keep building on, we've talked to um, Natalie as part of Jane's team about whether we do that centrally through the council. But again, the challenge there is how much do people want to share their information that's right. with the council? So th there's no perfect way. The nightmare. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So members, um, we'll now turn to Accent. And Louise, could you give us an update? Thank you. Yeah. Louise is going. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, hope you can hear us OK. I'm here from Accent this evening. I'm now three months in when I met you last. I think it was my second week. Um, my colleague, David Hall, customer... Hello partner manager within Surrey Heath area is also here and online. Um, sorry if you could go to the next slide. We have some lovely pictures of my colleagues, Edith Shah, who is our director of property services, and James Place, who is our income strategist. Next slide, please. 
Uh, following on from our colleagues within the borough, we wanted to talk a bit about what we are doing at Accent um, to help residents with the cost of living crisis. We do try to be more than just a landlord. Um, so we have been focusing on an education and communication campaign. So educating our staff to recognise indicators of hardship and to question those and try and dig deeper than what people may be presenting on the surface. They've had training under the Carbon Literacy Project, which helps alleviate fuel poverty. And so they're able to give that advice to our residents. And we've recently done a proactive communications campaign. So there was a big online um, social media campaign trying to reach out to our residents to contact us if, there's, if they're having any issues. Uh, but we are also aware that a lot of residents are not digitally um, literate or may not have access. So we've been doing some good old fashioned door knocking, telephone calls and visits to homes essentially to try and target our most vulnerable. Next slide, please. You might ask how we, how we identify our most vulnerable when we have around two and a half thousand households um, within the borough. So we have created a data-led approach, which is an algorithm. It seems quite far removed from the actual work with people, but I can assure you the things that we've looked into on that is things like how the percentage of people's rent has gone up, when we've last heard from them, how many people are in the household. Um, but we are not just um, driven by the data. We then have our own local knowledge. Our customer partners know their patches quite well and residents within it. This really was trying to target those that can go under the radar and may not ask for help because we recognise we're in a unique position to have an impact on those people's lives. We, I did want to highlight, uh, we did a, a door knock in late September where we got a team together and we, as it says on the tin, we went round knocking on doors, trying to speak to our customers. We managed to knock on 600 doors and we had around 200 people answer and we got some good, um, good quality feedback from that around what our customers want to see. And it did help us further identify um, some of those indicators I spoke about so that we could help know our residents better. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of partnership work, and we are a national organisation, so we do work with national um, charities such as Change and Money Helper. But then we are... Obviously, we have a local presence here and, and some of our colleagues uh, that were here this evening, we've been doing some work with St. Martin's Church, Safa, Frimley Fuel, for example. And uh, we do actually have our own campaign at Accent called Talk. Sorry, that's on another slide. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the Talk Money Week was the social media campaign that we did. Um, and we have donated um, some equipment to help um, with the food bank that our colleague mentioned. Um, next slide, please. We do have some YouTube videos, but they haven't really embedded in the slide properly. So um, when you receive the slides, we do have some videos of um, case studies, um, to be frank, around what our residents have got from our campaign and from our income team who support residents maximise income and access um, all benefits they may be entitled to. The income team and our customer partners also um, signpost to appropriate agencies. Um, the next slide, please. This is the campaign I prematurely mentioned, which is our More Than Homes campaign. It's um, a social housing sector-wide thing that Accent lead um, because we recognise, again, we're in a unique position to tackle food poverty within our own um, homes that we provide and possibly are able to have a, a reach uh, through our work that maybe other organisations don't necessarily have. So we've raised um, 400,000 through that and the campaign's target is 1 million and we do hope to create that. Um, next slide please. 
a bit about the wider work we've been doing. So we have currently 66 homes within Surrey Heath uh, undergoing retrofit. We're doing a fabric first approach, which essentially is um, focused on insulating the home so that we're going to reduce fuel bills, hopefully, for our residents, as well as reduce carbon emissions from our homes. Um, and the, the residents who are receiving that are looking forward to that bit of work. We do have further retrofit projects nationally, so it's something that Accent are experienced at and should hopefully provide um, positive outcomes in Surrey Heath. Um, next slide, please. And then the next slide, please. Um, so I know that repairs and maintenance is something that comes up often and is very um, close to yourselves. And I know, um, because we see them, you receive a lot of queries from the community. Um, so we have added in a bit. And like I said, my colleague Edith is here to take any questions. But we're really pleased to announce we've launched a new tech hub. And that's a specialist contact centre. So now when a resident rings in, they're going through to people who've been trained. As it says um, on the slide there, we did an intensive four-week training programme. These are technical individuals who are able to talk um, the caller through the repair and get a better diagnosis on the phone so that when we send our contractors, we're hoping to get an increase of first-time fixes a reducing repairs related to complaints through reporting the wrong repair or getting the wrong contractor, for example, and focus on a first call resolution and give advice to the customers on that first call. Um, the tech hub, people ring through, we can get the contractors on the phone at the same time, so it is a really quick resolution um, if people have to chase up, which we hope, we really do hope that they don't. Um, next slide, please. Our open orders have decreased by 22.5% since we last met. Our legacy jobs have also reduced to approximately 721, so we're now under 1,000 in the region. And of particular note is that 70% of our electrical legacy jobs have been completed. Uh, we do have, um, as you know, some outstanding fencing work and we've had to appoint that to a new contractor, uh, which, is a, which is a large chunk of the legacy jobs. We're looking to turn around our voids quicker. We know that that is an issue um, which we're very aware of and a lot of work has gone into the contractors who are working on our voids and getting them turned around quickly. We do really want to support our colleagues in the council um, to fulfil their the housing needs of, of the constituents. We've also had some new additions to the team in the south. Um, so we've got two new maintenance surveyors, a specialist um, disrepair surveyor, which I will again come on to in a bit more detail, and a new trainee surveyor. So we, we have a bit of strength in the team now. We do still have some issues with appointing a roofing contractor so unfortunately um, we're struggling to close down those legacy repairs and at the moment Ian Williams are picking those up um, next slide please we've added in um, a little bit on damp and mold because uh, I'm, I'm sure we're all in agreement very um, saddened by the news that Awab Ishark's death was caused by damp and mould in a social housing property. And we're very conscious our MP is Michael Gove, who's written to all registered providers, including us at Accent. Um, so we kind of wanted to just give you a little bit of assurance on our damp and mould approach. Um, so we have a specialist contractor who we've recently appointed who specialises in damp and mould, as it says on the tin, so they will be tending to any damp and mould issues that we have. Again, we're hoping for first-time fix for solutions that are going to work rather than repeat call-outs and essentially people having to live in those conditions. That is not what we want. Um, and I mentioned a new disrepair surveyor. So just to clarify, they will be working on any complex 
issues, any complaints that come in that aren't easy to resolve. And so damp and mould will sit under them. So we, all, as well as a specialist contractor, we'll have a specialist surveyor. But the whole team, um, and me and Edith work in close collaboration with this, the whole team are very, very conscious of this at the moment. Um, so we are, hopefully we'll have some, if you have any queries on it, we can provide data on what we've got um, going forward. Thank you very much. Um, questions, please. I have um, Edith's on the line and James Place, who does if any questions on cost of living, and David and myself for housing management. Thank, thank you for a very detailed um, report there, Louise, and we will get the slides out to the members. If I can just start the ball rolling, I've got two questions in from councillors that couldn't make it here tonight. Um, one of them I'll ask you now, but I'll, I'll be giving them to Jane, who will email with you, and then if you could liaise, it's the easiest way, I think, Louise. Yep, that's um, fine. One of them you just mentioned, Mould. We've got um, Provident House in Bagshot. Um, they've got other queries as well, but they're saying about flats, the several flats there, unsafe levels of black mould, and they want a response to that. Provident House, Bagshot. Okay, if we can have that through on an email, please, because they'd need investigating, because we'd have to have a look to see if we've had any recent repairs requests or any information relating to that. Um, I won't go into details about individual properties or anything, because we just can't do that. But we need to investigate and see what we've got on file and then carry out. What we do when with all damp and mould is, you know, we are, we are quite... Um, we're in a good position in accent nationally on damp and mould. Um, we've got some process. We'd already started this process with the disrepair surveys and bringing them on and looking at our damp and mould. And we can actually get reports to tell us how many cases we've got and what they relate to, whether it's first time um, bringing a damp and mould case to our attention and how we follow the step by step. So we have a process to follow. If it's a first time call, then potentially it's a kit going out, a damp and mould kit to the resident to do a mould wash solution. If we get a second call, then it's potentially an inspection by a severe and doing a report on the property um, and I've made it perfectly clear to all the building service managers not just for Surrey Heath but for every national every region that we do not state it's a lifestyle issue that has now gone we have to be seen to be helping residents and we have to find a solution to the problems we cannot be stating it's a lifestyle issue no organization should be doing that and we are there and we will find solutions and we will help the residents through this it is going to be difficult. I'm not going to say it isn't. We've got challenges because we've got residents, as you clearly heard previously, they're scared to put their heat in on. You know, they've got no form of drying clothes. They don't want to put the dryer on. So they put them on the radiators for the length of time they do have the heating on. That that creates moisture in the property. But we have to help the residents through this and find solutions. And that's what we're about. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Josephine. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Could I ask, you were saying at the beginning of your presentation that you knocked on a number of houses, and I can't remember what the number was or what responses you had. What area specifically were they in Surrey? Sure. Can you get, was it, was it but deep, uh, if you could tell me what sort of parts of the ward you actually went to. Um, I, I went out myself. I was on the old dean. We had quite a few on the old dean. Um, deep part, I'm not sure where else. Bag shot. Yeah, bag shot. Sorry, wherever we had stock, we had yeah, the relevant customer partner out to go out with another colleague, and they went to all our areas. That's not to say we got everybody in, in those areas, but an attempt was made in each of the areas in, in where we have stock. Uh, sort of specific areas, but you actually went to all the areas within the within Surrey Heath that you have. Yeah, stopped, where we obviously. have right. stopped. Thank you. We didn't we didn't get round to all the doors. Um, sadly, with six hundred we attempted and two hundred about around two hundred answered. I'm going to just come back, uh, Chairman. So, is six hundred the number that you actually have? Yes. Yeah, so six hundred were knocked. So four about around four hundred didn't answer. 
and 200 answered. So about a third of the doors were knocked on, we got a response. 600 is the... Attempts, uh, yeah. No, but is 600 the actual number no. that you have? No, no, what sadly. What is the actual number? Two, about 2,500. Um, so we do... It, it, it was a one-off, not a one-off, sorry. It was a first-time project. We wanted to see how it went. We feel it, Axon, it was quite successful. The residents that we did speak to um, seem pleased to have somebody to actually come to them and ask, you know, what could we change around here? So can I ask if you will be asking the other, not the houses that you didn't get a response from, but the other <coughs> areas that you didn't actually knock on the doors, if you will be going to them uh, so that you can compare? Thank you. Did you yeah, so maybe if I can answer that. So in addition to the 600, what was mentioned in the presentation was our customer care checks. So we've used data on our people who probably don't speak to us day in, day out on a regular basis. So we hold the data for the people who are door knocked. We also hold the data on the people who we're going through on a priority basis, so, so in particular groups. So we are, we, we are very hopeful that our most vulnerable customers within our stock will get a door knock and when I talk about a customer care visit it's not a telephone call it's an actual door knock and invite for a conversation in a positive way about we're trying to promote fuel quality and other things like that to get to get ourselves in to have those discussions. Morgan. Thank you chair um, I'm pleased to see the numbers coming down of the on the legacy repairs obviously I know there's still more to do so I'm not going to hang around on that point. What I was very pleased to see in your presentation was an emphasis on decarbonisation and tackling fuel poverty. Um, and I'm just wondering, as a large owner of properties within Surrey, are, is Accent taking, can, well, is Accent and can Accent take advantage of the schemes that come out of Surrey County Council with regarding um, the grants for potential fuel alleviation through potential solar panels or ground source heat pumps or insulation. I'm just wondering, is Axon able to, as a housing association, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure, uh, and if you are able and you weren't aware, I just wanted to highlight that to you. I believe it's through Action on Action Surrey, which is being run. Um, I did also, um, Edith kind of raised it uh, and kind of, I think, gave me an answer, but I'm just wondering what... <clears throat> Is Accent doing to, re to, to reassure and encourage the residents that they have who are scared to put on their heating, which then could then lead to them getting damp and mold? I'm just wondering what is in place to provide them the reassurance that they, they, that they should, and I obviously and what support then is in place to potentially not have them fall into fuel property. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rise, and thank you for your praise for our repairs. Uh, we really are trying to get them down, I can assure you. Um, so we have got funding through the decarbonisation fund, um, and we're currently going through that second wave. In terms of more local availability, I would have to make um, my counterpart, Alex Lybird, um, aware because all the retrofit comes under him so I'd have to ask him I'd like to think he's tapping into it I do Louise know. Louise the thing is we can tap into some of it but we have to be very careful and where we can tap into local funding we do but there is stipulations about the funding that we get from the government as well and you can only apply for a certain amount of funding regardless which avenue you take but we do try to look at every avenue to to get funding from any means but I'm sure Alex would be interested in what local funding there is down in Surrey Heath so it'd be it'd be great if we can have some information on that and we can check it out um but we can't unfortunately it would be great to take every bit of funding that we can get but unfortunately there is stipulations around government funding around carb decarbonisation about how many times you can apply for it um either with local um councils and what have you and do a joint funding venture or whether you do it on your own so it is it's very difficult sometimes because you can't get it all yeah, we'll, we'll certainly check it out. And I know yeah. I'm, on, I'm on the board of a small housing association elsewhere and um, they've been looking at stuff and a lot of it is like the resident has to apply rather than mm -hmm. the um, association. But if you do hear of anything, uh, we're 
definitely interested in that. I will hand over to my colleague James in a sec, but what I, what I failed to say in the slides, when the nerves are going, you miss out certain things. <laughs> We've got a hardship fund. Um, so we do help residents that we come across in the customer check, care checks, whether it's the door knocking exercises we do. It could even be a phone call to the tech hub, any kind of communication that comes in. Like I said, we've trained staff on recognising those indicators. So if we do recognise the indicators, we have a, a small fund and it's to help people immediately. So we are trying our best to, to refer um, to the appropriate charities because we... We are conscious it's you know we're not we're not feeding a man to fish so to speak it is just helping at that immediate crisis point um james i don't know if there's anything you would like to add cheers louise um just separately that we've also recently um had a an old colleague briefing from an organization called the green energy doctor um, they are based in Yorkshire, but they, they briefed all colleagues across, uh, as Louise said, we're a National Housing Association, so they briefed all colleagues about simple energy tips, about savings and the best way to um, have an energy efficient home, um, and also tips on, on who to reach out to, um, so that we can essentially signpost um, residents in, in any any region to, to certain organisations where they could get help so that, you know, if they are worried about turning on that heating, um, that the, the knows there's support out there that we can refer them on to. And I know that David um, and his counterpart, the, the other customer partner manager and his, and his teams are doing a fantastic job at building a re, what we're calling a regional signposting matrix. And that will consist of any kind of support that that we could refer a resident to for for any kind of reason so you know such as debt or energy efficiency and um, so that uh, yeah colleagues can refer them directly to those local um organizations which exist already in uh, in the uh, borough if i could maybe just chair if you might just expanding on that if you don't mind um, you mentioned about the fuel poverty, so um, Edith, my colleague, may also want to add, but please don't think that our property team will do the inspections and not talk to housing management. We have regular meetings with my counterpart, Adam, locally, about those type of meetings. So, in fairness, we're not interested where the information comes from. We want to support our customers through it, and however that is through advice and what have you, and the relevant funds. So there is communication from whether it's our door knocking, whether it's through a repair because they think they've got door damp or mould. So it is a joined up approach. So. Sean, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chair, and I apologise for my dog who seems to be getting on the um the camera more than i am um firstly i'd like to preface what i'm about to say with i fully understand that things are getting a lot better um obviously on the old dean i'm sure rodney agree we we've got the highest amount of accent houses so we probably get a higher than most rage of different issues and complaints but this week two people came up to me on the food stall and have said the service from Accent is no better than it was. Um, Ian Williams are no better than the previous people. I'm just talking, this is off, this is the comments I'm getting. I've got mould, it's been there for five years, it's still not being fixed. So still, whatever you're doing, as far as reducing the numbers is obviously good, but the the impression that people are getting is still is still not the best. And I won't mention a name, but I've, and I've literally sent this to you while I've been sitting here this evening. I have an email. And it starts, I'm sorry to be emailing you again, but I feel the lack of support from Accent is just beyond belief. I have called several times to chase up repairs, which are still not being addressed. And I've had my younger one in hospital again due to chest and asthma. I'm not going to read the rest of the email because it doesn't read any better than that. But you really do need to sort out your legacies. The legacies are the ones that are the most important. OK, these guys have been complaining I've had two or three in the last couple of months, which I've, I've sent straight to Sarah Jane. I know she's speaking to you guys. So I'm keeping out of the loop because I'm conscious that she's trying to obviously sort everything out with you. But everything you're telling me is that the numbers are going down, which I see they are. But I'm still hearing of all the ones that seem to have been going on for a number of years 
that still aren't being fixed. Okay. I afforded this email to you tonight. So guys, you can look at it tomorrow. This is someone I've already emailed to you two weeks ago and I was told they were going to look at it and that's the response they're giving me, okay? So whatever you're doing, these people are still not happy and we really, really need to address them, okay? I'm sorry to be negative because I have been one of the... When I was portfolio holder, I was really trying to support everything you're doing, but I'm still hearing the same old stories and for me, it still is doesn't appear to be getting any better for my residents and I apologise for, as I say, for being a downer and being negative, but that's how I feel with what's coming into my inbox right now. Thank you. That is disappointing to hear, and we will look at each case individually. There's always two sides to a story, and I'm sure there's some information around that. But, you know, we hear about all the negative comments around what we're not doing, you know, great and what have you. People don't report on the good things that we that we're achieving, considering the amount of repairs we get. Um, you know, it's phenomenal. The, let me just have a look at this. Um, we've got on-site open orders of one thousand nine hundred and sixty-four. You know, we we are starting to. You know, our routine completed twenty-eight days. The percentage has gone down because we're completing the legacy, so that will drop our percentage. First time fix has gone up to 80%. So we are getting there. It's not perfect. No housing association is perfect, but we are doing lots of things that are right. Unfortunately, you get the minority, which are we, we are doing wrong, but we are working very hard to put those right as well. And we continue. Yes, we've got one main contractor, but I am continually gaining other contractors to join Accent so that we can look. We've brought on Quest to do um, Damp and Maud. I'm about to bring on another contractor who will specialise in delivering our disrepair cases and getting that work done. So that's taken away from Ian Williams and we can have quick turnarounds on those. And that will be part of the Damp and Maud as well. So we are looking at that. Um, as you know, you know, it's no excuse. I've been here now six months. It does take time to turn an orbit, you know, to turn things around from where it was. It's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen in the first six months. It will take time. But we are working very hard behind the scenes to make sure we do improve things. And, you know, I appreciate that this particular resident has had a few issues and we'll look at them and see what's going on. Um, and we'll address that and, and obviously give some comment back to that. Thank, thank you for that. Rodney. <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't know Sean was going to say what he did. Um, let, let me just start with a couple of positives first, because I, I'm really pleased to hear about the doorstep campaign. I think it's really good to go out in the community, as we do as politicians, to speak to people to find out exactly what the issues are. So I credit those who went out and did that and had, I, I've no doubt, some very good conversations. And also, um, I am really delighted about the pretty massive change of culture in regard to mould. Um, what was said earlier about that we've moved away from this lifestyle blame, that, that has historically been a problem, not just in Accent, but many other housing associations, where rather than addressing the modern issue, tenants historically got the blame. Whether that was fire, fair or not fair, sometimes you know, the, the tenants could absolutely be doing things differently. But to tell, as I've in numerous cases in the past, I can remember one in particular, where um, you know somebody whose sick child was was constantly in hospital and being told by a housing officer many years ago that this was down to them, uh, their lifestyle was totally inappropriate. So I'm delighted that that is a cultural change. So I applaud you for that. And I wish you every success in, in moving that forward. And I'm glad that that is being taken seriously. Um, however, <laughs> I would echo a number of things that Sean just said. Um, I can only go from what information I've, I'm getting um, I do accept I used to be a housing officer myself. There's two sides to every story. But I think one of the main, uh, the, the disappointing things from our side of it is the customer service element. And I would welcome a separate conversation, I think, with David. We all understand when repairs are needed. You know, we, we get that. We have it with our own properties. But there are several themes that seem to be happening over and over again. And one in particular, which is being regularly reported to us, is where... Somebody comes to visit from a contractor point of view. They can't fix the, the thing. I, we understand that. The tenant gets told some, they'll get a call the next day because the contractor's told them. It doesn't get put on the system. So accent aren't aware of that, but the tenant still thinks that they're getting a call, which doesn't happen. And that we hear that 
time again, and I hear it from other councillors as well. I was having a conversation with other councillors, similar sort of thing. So I think it, I, I think there's a, a separate conversation to be had regarding that. And in terms of the numbers, I, I have to be honest, I, I, I do appreciate the accent in terms of numbers may be improving, and that's great. But if I'm a resident, I want my, my one dealt with. I'm not really interested in everyone else's, if I'm done with you. You know, so it's good if, if as as politician I, I am, absolutely, that's great to hear. But if I am a tenant and my house is not being repaired or, or there's problems with it, then I don't really care if, if everyone else is. In fact, that's probably worse. I probably wonder why, why everyone else is, is doing done before me. Uh, it, I, I guess I would just flag up, uh, many of our tenants, and I know you know this already, um, are vulnerable people. They don't like to moan, believe it or not, because many of them, it's the last straw for them. And so whilst I don't want things thought it's just mould or it's just a window or it's just whatever it is, this is the last straw with a load of other things that is going on in their life that actually accent are not contributing to in any way, shape or form, but it just happens to be the thing that tips them over. So um, I just want that understood. I'm sure that you do, but I, and I know you do as senior managers, but I'm not necessarily sure that is fully understood throughout every member of staff in the organisation. The housing officers, by the way, are great. Housing managers, really good, and I credit them. I work well with them. Um, uh, but these are the sorts of things that are a bit frustrating. Not not repairs. We get that. We know things go wrong. But it's the customer service element. And you know, I'm sure that Sean probably echo it and many other councillors too. So perhaps we can have a separate conversation around that. Um, we can, but Councillor Bates, I feel the frustration. I know you do. And, I know you do. And, and I, you see some I of the have, cases that we have as well. Absolutely. And I, and I have a big meeting tomorrow with the main contractors. Yeah. And one of my gripes, if you like, um, is when there is follow-on works, it should be called through to their contact centre while the customer is in front of the operative so that the next appointment can be arranged. And I, I will be reiterating that tomorrow because as far as I'm concerned, the responsibility lies with that operative. And I've been in this game a long time and I, I, know, I know the tricks of the trade. And I want that operative in front of that resident, ringing their contact centre for a follow-on job and making sure that that operative is the one who has to go back because that's where we're going to increase first time fix because they will do it first time and they'll get that work done and that's what my aim is so I am driving that forward because I do feel the frustrations of residents you know I am passionate when my passion stops I won't be doing this job my passion is still there and I'm here to work for the residents um, and I'll keep delivering that and I'll make sure that the team I drive forward, my surveyors, my building service managers have all the same passion as I do and making sure that these contractors do what they should be doing. It's frustrating for us as much as the residents and we want to get on top of that. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I think Councillor Bates asked a direct question about meeting outside the meeting. Councillor Bates, outside of the meeting, I'm more than happy to contact you or any of the members to have that discussion about customer service, whether it's from a repair point of view, because Adam, my colleague, was also very keen about the passion leaders just spoke about, but generally about our customer service, we're more than happy to do that. Well, can I thank you, all of you from Accent and the team, being here tonight and on via Zoom, we do appreciate that and uh, you being able to answer some of these questions. And, and uh, thank you very much. Unbelievable. Is this is the office of myself um, and Morgan? Is to we've got the police. It's their annual um, visit here the next February, and we're looking um, to have another sort of forum like this on antisocial behaviour because this this brings in not just the police but all, all areas of what they do and the other bodies within the borough. 
Um, and along that, with that, we will have accent back as, as well. Um, Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. So it, it brings in so much uh, environment, antisocial behaviour, as, as I said. So um, would you be in agreement with that as a committee that that's what we actually focus in on in February? Yes? Yes, well, I think tonight's worked well, actually. Okay. Well, can I thank the officers and Nick to be here as well? It's, I think it's been a very uh, valuable evening and for all members for, for partaking tonight. Thank you very much. Josephine. Uh, uh, sorry, Gemma, I was just reading. I'm sitting here, sort of in a day, isn't it? Um, clearly missing my dinner, that's what this is. Um, you've got citizens' advice done again. Do we? Yeah. All right. Okay. I thought. Okay. Right. But the rest of the ones will be. Because in it, on that police and the antisocial behaviour and the branches that could be involved. So we we won't be having uh, the tree warden because I think that no, was they were coming. We, we, we will have a June meeting. So we're having to, we're ha we're trying to prioritise what we feel is okay. really important at this time. Because I, I know they were well. Trees are quite important to quite a few residents actually. Uh, so I'm disappointed that isn't coming because I, uh, I know that was coming to this meeting and it was put back to February. I think it's yeah. a shame uh, yeah. that we're not able to have them when uh, they were going to come. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but okay. Right. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And safe journey home. And all keep well. There's a lot of illness about at the moment. That's why some of our councillors are not here. Yeah.